and uh, we will start the Big Data Europe on Transport webinar now. We had a workshop in October in Bordeaux about the uh, elicitation of requirements and needs, and this webinar is assessing what we learned so far. We have our speakers uh, who will show the different angles. Dave Marples from Technolution will present a business point of view. Sean Gaines from Vicom Tech will assess the data and technology. And finally, Maxime Flamand will uh, talk about the policy aspects. A few words on the webinar attendee interface. Uh, you have a collapsible menu on your right. And if you have any issues with the visuals or the audio, you can modify the settings there. We ask you to type your questions in the question panel also in this menu. The participants are muted throughout the webinar, so this will be your forum for asking questions from the speakers. Please use these chat boxes. Uh, finally, if you would like to know more about the project, uh, we invite you to join our W3C group. You can see the link and uh, to subscribe to the, our newsletter or follow us on social media. You can see the various links. We will share the presentations uh, via slide share links and uh, these will be provided after the webinar along with a summary. So if you're ready, Dave, then uh, we can start with you. Yes, I'm certainly ready. Oh, went a little horribly wrong. There we go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Andrea, can you see my screen okay? Yes, it's all perfect. Splendid. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave Marples from Technolution. Um, my interest in this as a, as a commercial organization, as a, a completely commercial organization, is uh, always the business angle. What does big data mean for us? What are the opportunities? What are the threats? that it provides um, in that kind of environment. So the first question that anyone is going to ask perfectly reasonably in a, a big data discussion is, well, why do I want to do it? And the simple fact of the matter is that businesses live or die based on what they know. That's, that's always been the case and always will be the case, right from the days where a simple business was uh, being the one guy that had got a watch or a clock and could go around and tell everybody else the time. Uh, through to where we are now with significant accruals of data and raw information in certain businesses which are then made available to others. So these data might be knowledge of their customers, the, the, their operating environment, they have information no one else has, their products themselves in terms of IP uh, on how to build the products or whatever, or even things they know about their competitors which give them edge in discussions and uh, bidding competitions with those competitors. If a business doesn't take advantage of these sources of information they have, they always will expose themselves to risk and operational compromise. That's a simple fact of life. And it is the case that big data is just one more source. It isn't anything special in itself. Uh, it's just one more source of information that a business lives that needs to live. And finding the information within those raw data, sifting through it, um, might, might be, a, trick, might be a, a difficult trick, depending on the type of the data, the amount of noise in there, and so on and so forth. So I want to go on and talk briefly about the roles that people will take in a big data ecosystem. And these roles are taken by different actors or different types of organizations, commercial companies such as my own research institutions and public authorities. And they have different, each of these types of organizations have different motivations for uh, playing a part in a big data ecosystem, particularly on the releasing data side of the house, making these data available. So there are three distinct roles that, that I foresee. The first is the publishers who make the data available. They are the sources of the raw data um, they provide these data on, a, on a, an ad hoc basis or on a structured basis, doesn't really matter, but they, in some way, shape or form, 
they are the sources of the data. We then have the distillers who will combine, refine, render down the data and extract useful information. These are the processors of those data. Now, the role of being a distiller actually has distinct and significant value all of its own because the skill of distilling useful information from raw data is quite a good skill to have. So there is a distinct role for a distiller. And then, of course, we have the consumer. They use the published data sets or even the information um, from those data sets in order to, to make or inform decisions or actions. They are sinks of the data. They are the ones who consume the data and use them to perform some action. So if I look at typical data publishers, the kinds of guys that are out there right now, we have people like the National Data Warehouse uh, in the Netherlands who produce or make available a huge range of different data um, on traffic information of one form or another. We also have other organizations such as Transport for London who've created quite a big open data initiative. Uh, and again, well, I'm going to come back and talk about motivations in a few moments. Uh, the motivations between NDW and Transport for London are largely similar. They're a, they're, they're a public organization there to solve, serve their populace. And their interest in making these data available is to grease the wheels or grease the cogs of mobility within their, within their ecosystem. We look at a slightly different one. We've got NASA, who've got it's not really a technical term, but a shed load of data of various forms from their missions and from their uh, undertakings that they performed over the years. And they make a huge amount of those data uh, available through one form or another. And they do that for a slightly different reason to NDW and uh, TFL. They do that because they simply do not have the brain bandwidth to be able to do all the processing which are possible on this data. So this is an example of, um, uh, of a data provider who doesn't know what they are releasing in their data. They don't know what content they've really got, what useful information they've got in those data. So by making it available, other people can peruse it, process it, and find out new things about it. We then have somewhat more typical kinds of uh, players in this space. Uh, Picasa, who reproduce or republish uh, photographs and material that are provided to them by, by individual users. Again, a source of data, perhaps not a source of data you think of for, for travel applications, but certainly Facebook, certainly Twitter, you could think of as being um, transport-centric to some degree. Uh, you know, the, the, if you get start getting tweets about car parks being full or roads being busy or whatever, that impacts on the trans on the on the um, uh, travel episode. So these things do have a role to play in this kind of space. But these are raw data sources. A single tweet on its own doesn't tell you about anything very much. A Facebook post on its own doesn't tell you very much. Uh, a picture on Picasa doesn't tell you very much. And you also have uh, Amazon. I've put up there as one that's slightly out in left field because the role of Amazon is um, effectively a data publication role. They make data available in the hope you will make a decision based on it. It's not transport centric. Yet, I could have used the obvious example of, of someone like Uber um, who make data available in the hope that you'll make use of it. Well, I try to be a little bit out in, in that field and suggest someone a little bit different to the usual ones. If I look at the distillers, the people that try and extract useful information, there's obviously the elephant in the room. Um, these guys spend a large amount of their lives uh, scrunching data of one form or another for all sorts of purposes, all the way from using it for transport-related activities in the form of Google Maps and Maps overlays and things like this, through to improving search results, through to improving search accuracy um, and characterizing individual users and so on. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> But then I can also look at other people that process these data and do interesting things with them. Camel Camel is, oh, sorry, Camel Camel Camel, three camels, uh, is one you've probably not heard of. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm following this Amazon uh, line of thought. And these guys just take all the data from Amazon, scrunch it, 
and will tell you, scrunch is obviously a technical term, um, and will tell you uh, when something is at its lowest price at Amazon. So they will dynamically track this information or this, if you're looking at buying a TV for whatever or whatever, you can set a watch and say, hey, when this television goes below a certain price, please email me or whatever. So they are effectively doing a distillation activity on your behalf. There are more traditional distillers, people like XE, who produce exchange rates. I'll just use them as an example, but there, there are plenty more. These are the, the kinds of people that look at a particular market, understand its characteristics, understand its dynamic, and use that to produce forecasting information. And the obvious one for the transport space is folks like Aviva, the insurance companies. And the value to them of distilling these data, of pulling out useful information from these data, is actually realized internally. They are also a data consumer, because the more understanding they have over their, their client base, over the dynamics of incidents, over the dynamics of their uh, risk fleet, so the vehicles they've got on risk and things like this, the more information that they can derive about that, the more competitively they can price their offerings, and so potentially the better mar margin they can make. The risk, of course, for these guys, if they get it wrong, is directly to their business. So they have a very strong motivation for distilling these data in the appropriate and correct way. If I go on and look at typical consumers and take a very obvious one in the transport space, which are the, the folks who, who will perform direct action based on data. So uh, if we follow a, a weather system from the data that come from the, the weather sensors, which are wide area sensors, through to, in the UK, we would call it the Met Office, the Meteorological Office, who will... Um, take those data and distill them down into weather forecasts. And then at the other end of the, of the flow, we have, for example, a fisherman, the guy who is going to decide whether or not he goes out to sea, because if that decision is wrong, lives are literally at stake. If we come more to what's a more comfortable and conventional transport space for, for where I would typically operate, then you've got folks like Tom Tom. Uh, you've got Google Map. The thing is, you can use Google for everything, so I try and avoid it. Um, but you've got the, the mapping guys and the folks that can use these data in order to improve your, your transport episode, for example. We also have, I couldn't really find a good picture for a government, so this is my best, best attempt at a picture for a government. Uh, governments and uh, information that informs societal dynamics and societal change. So understanding where growth in a population is likely to occur, understanding where I need to build new roads, where my pressure points are on my existing network or whatever it happens to be. Those things all are done. They consume data, and they have thirst for data. You see folks thrashing around um, looking for information if they don't have it. They, and the, the form of the thrashing around is doing things like surveys or asking questionnaires or looking for data sources or instrumenting new capabilities in order to obtain these data from which they can derive information that they need to form decisions. And then finally, a slightly more frivolous one, uh, but absolutely fundamentally based on the, the processing and the consumption of data. Bear in mind in this ecosystem, people do take multiple roles. So um, a, a betting uh, company such as William Hill will both process data and will consume it in order to price effectively their offer. They're a different form of, insur of an insurance company, if you like. So again, they will live or die on the accuracy of the predictions that they make. If I spin slightly forward now and look to, when I talk to people about people who've got data that I would like to have access to, then you always get back uh, a number of objections, and the objections are, are pretty pretty standard, to be perfectly honest. Well, if I make my data available, it will help my competitors. And to some degree, that is indeed the case. I've got a friend who uh, sells electronic components, and he wrote a script that went to one of his competitors' website 
and scraped the price of every single component from their website, if you like a little miniature version of this camel, camel, camel thing. Um, and from that, he was able to tell when new components were coming out, when they were end of lining things, when they were bringing in new versions of things and so on and so forth. So he could infer a lot of information from the data that people have made available. But you have to consider against that, what is the value of making my data available? Yes, there is always a risk in doing anything in business. The way to avoid risk is to not do anything. That isn't called business. Um, so you have to find somewhere that's a happy medium between the two. And in general, the people who ask this question and the people who are concerned about this particular question tend to be what I would term C-level people. These are people at the top of the organization that are interested in the strategic dynamic of it, not necessarily the day-to-day -day operation of it. This one's quite important. Am I going to damage my business, my model, my reputation? Uh, a classic case there in the transport sector would be uh, a train operator that doesn't want to release um, uh, scheduling accuracy information about how well they have performed against their schedules. But those data are really useful to users in order to know, is this bus always late every day? They're really useful to regulators to know, do I have to go and have a conversation with that organization to get them to improve their performance? So systemically, the data are very, very valuable to an individual organization. They may actually have some downside. And in that circumstance, it is possible that either through contractual means or through legislation, you have to enforce uh, some kind of release guarantee. So it's not uncommon now, particularly in um, public contracts of one form or another, to see open data uh, requirements noted in those contracts. The data you produce will be made available in an open documented format and things like this on a timely basis. So that is becoming increasingly common, particularly when um, in, on an individual basis, the consequence of release may not be beneficial to the basis, to the, to the company. Or my business depends on confidentiality and privacy. That's a perfectly justifiable line of argument. If you can anonymize the data, and the question is if you can anonymize the data, uh, then by all means you should release it and maybe you get the benefit from doing so. The classic case there was um, some uh, New York um, uh, taxi data about the origins and destinations of individual um, uh, taxi trips, which was considered to be anonymized because it didn't say who the individuals were that were making the trips or anything like this. But of course, when some enterprising little guy gets hold of this data and starts to scrunch it down, you start to be able to do slightly embarrassing things like identify where the people who go to the strip clubs actually live and things of this nature. So there's all sorts of things that you can do that perhaps you thought you'd anonymized against, but you haven't because these data are, by definition, pretty rich. And then the very last one, which I've heard on more than one occasion, is who on earth would want my data? Who would be interested in my data? But the thing is, because you don't understand everyone else's model, you don't understand what everyone else is going to do, you can't answer that question from your perspective. There's, a, a, again, a, a discussion we've had about um, do, the, does the, do the sales of beer and sausages go up when there's a big German football game going on, for example, uh, on a Saturday afternoon? And can I predict... Um, the busyness of the roads or whatever from the sales of beer and sausages. It sounds ridiculous, but I can't answer that question, and it is quite possible that I can do so, because certainly in my country, in the UK, we've got a big football match on. The sales of beer at the supermarkets go through the roof, and the reason is pretty straightforward. People go around to their friend's house, have a little party, watch the big match or whatever, and it has an implication for other things about the dynamics of the society. But from the perspective of the guy selling the beer, he can't possibly say, hey, um, I can't imagine that anyone needs my beer data and I'm just going to help my competitors by telling them how much, how much beer I do sell. There are some real risks. We've already touched on one of them. There's a risk that you're releasing a lot more information than you think you are. And the classic one for this is the Please Rob Me um, website. 
which goes over Twitter. It doesn't now, by the way. It's 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 closed down. It was it was done to um, to highlight the problem. It was not done as a commercial enterprise. But the intention behind this website was to uh, highlight to people that if you post on Facebook, hey, we're going away for a weekend. What you're actually posting on Facebook is, hey, my house is going to be over empty for the weekend. So by releasing data, even in a little, even one little piece of data, one little mote of data, quite often you're releasing a lot more information than you think you are because you have to look at it from the perspective of the recipient, not from the perspective of the sender. Your data may not be clean enough to be useful to others and it may damage your reputation or your business model if that ever was to become public. And the, again, the case for the, the, the argument for this one is, um, is quite strongly seen in the, some of the US health services, and that's actually the reference I've given there to the, to the Fortune, um, to the Fortune uh, article. This are, these are data where words are misspelled, so they're not searched for very accurately, decimal points are missing, the stuff is in uh, what we would term an analog format, it's handwritten notes as opposed to being machine uh, processable, things of these kinds of nature. Now, if you maintain a nice glossy sheen to the outside of your organization and don't make it visible that what's going off internally, it's the swan syndrome. Everything looks smooth and graceful and uh, elegant on top, but underneath the waterline, all hell's breaking loose. You can't see that if you have a facade, an effective facade. So there is a real risk if your data are not as clean, if your operational structures are not as clean as you would like the world to believe that they are, then you have a problem in making those data public. And the process of releasing your data can cost you money and maybe there is no benefit. As I said, the benefit is in the recipient, the benefit is to the recipient and um, in a process of karma, you hope that what goes around will come around and you will benefit in the process. Or maybe you're a societal enterprise, a government enterprise or whatever, and you believe that the benefit will be in improved operational behaviors or whatever. So it's possible that doesn't happen. You're throwing it over the fence and you can't really tell what will happen to it in consequence. But there are real opportunities here. As I already said, people will find value in your data. You'll not know it's there because you can't see it from your perspective. But maybe those that value can only be realized from other data, so in combination with other data sources. Maybe the sales of beer are not on off on their own. Maybe it needs the sales of beer and sausages and they're two different data sources. Maybe it needs public transport information and it also needs road transport information in order to tell you something about the behavior of traffic coming into your city. It's impossible for you as the source of the data to be 100% certain of what you will get out of releasing it. And that's almost a leap of faith that you have to make. This was something we discussed extensively in Bordeaux. And it's easier for uh, non-commercial entities to make a leap of faith because if you've got to stand in front of your CIO and your CTO and your CEO and say, I'm not sure what we're going to get out of this. It's going to cost us this amount of money, but this is what I want to do and here are the risks. Then maybe you ought to get your CV ready. But the right behavior, the right data, the right release of uh, data which contains useful information will drive desire, behaviors you desire. You don't want everyone to leave work at 5 p.m. You do want them to stagger the time at which they enter the motorway. A, the, a, the classic case for this is, is in, in, in our own office. Uh, all the data about the, um, the state of the motorways is live and available to all of our, all of our folks. And around 4 p.m., we see people's monitors switch over to the uh, traffic screen which has both the current traffic circumstance and the forecast traffic circumstance for the next three or four hours. So from that, they can then make a judgment, hey, this is the best time for me to leave the office in order to get home without being in a, in a car park for the next couple of hours. And that's societally beneficial because if everyone spreads their load in the same way, then you 
hopefully flatten out the dumps, you flatten out the peaks and troughs. It leads to all sorts of other things we don't really know the answer to yet, it can lead to oscillation, can lead to uncertainty, can lead to reinforcement behaviours, and some of that is being, or some of those questions are being dealt with by the universities. But to a first approximation, it's a dam site better than what we have right now. And as I've already said, there is a business in distilling and adding value to raw data. It's what stockbrokers always used to do. Unless you were a stockbroker yourself, unless you track stocks and shares yourself, you gave money to a stockbroker that you thought was processing the raw data and gleaning information from it in a better way than you were able to. So it's the people who can find the value in raw information will benefit from it. Challenges, there are plenty, I just chose a few. Once you make your data available, you need to publicize the fact it's there. Just putting it on a site somewhere is, is not enough to a first approximation. If we go back to the NDW, there's actually data indices which tell you what data are available, how you make use of them, uh, give you support on how to use them and so on. And also they have um, the ability to link you to distillers who will process those data on your behalf and turn them into useful information for your business, obviously for, for a price, there's a business model there. As an organization, as a business, or even as a, a, a non-business organization, you need to find the mechanism to extract the value. So perhaps it's more researcher eyes on those data, that's the NASA model. It's also, to some degree, the model that open source users if I throw things out there for a lot of eyeballs to take a look at, well, there's an old saying that with enough, with enough eyeballs, all bugs become shallow. So perhaps it's an improved resilience, uh, more uh, aggregate knowledge attacking a single problem, whatever it happens to be. Perhaps it's better systemic performance, your road network performs better, or there are less error cases because people can see that something that's happening is um, uh, causing an error case to occur and thus they can avoid it in their own systems or perhaps uh, something in your data allows them to predict an error case. If you've got a bridge out, if you tell people there's a bridge out, there's a fairly good chance they're going to find another route home. If you don't tell them, they're going to park in front of your bridge. And one of the last things I want to say, it's unclear at the moment how users can be guided to reliable data sources. The classic answer to this is, we'll let the market decide. Well, yes, that's valid, but the problem with letting the market decide is there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of noise in the process of the market deciding, and that can reduce the perceived value of these data sources and the big, and the, 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 the big data activity. And very finally, I want to make a recommendation. Look at Neely Kroos's work. She's, she's effectively retired now. Um, look at the almost exactly four, four years ago tomorrow, the communication which came out on open data and transparent governance. If you love your data, set it free. You will get benefit from doing so. Thank you very much. I will now hand back. Thank you, Dave, for the really interesting presentation. Um, Sean, if uh, you're here, we can start with you. Sure, no problem, Andrea. Uh, good evening, everybody. Let me just see if I can find my presentation here. So I assume you can all see, uh, one second here. Andrea, am I doing this correctly? Can people see my presentation? Um. Uh, yes, I can see it, uh, but it's not in slideshow mode. Now, yes. There we go. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach with my presentation, guys. Um, I'm trying to do a bit of a follow-up on the presentation I gave, uh, colleagues of ours from CERT and from Franthover also at the workshop in Bordeaux. So I'll try to be brief and I'll walk through. Um, just to give you a, a heads up, what we found as part of our discussion in Bordeaux was, depending on what part of the transport domain people are working in, whether it's more research, applied research, commercial, 
public authority, etc. perspectives, there's quite a different expectation and understanding of what data can do and how applications in the transport domain can be derived from big data. So I'm actually going to go through some of the analysis that we did and how we tried to get a grip on it and to come with some common understanding. Um, for those who are interested, um, if they look at this presentation after today's webinar, I suggest you look at the BDA's, uh, this uh, Big Data Europe um, website and download the previous presentations because there's quite a variety in different people's perception and understanding of how big data could contribute to transport challenges. Um, in my own case, the presentation I gave was dealing with data that was generated from vehicles, primarily in the automotive sector and on cars. Okay. But let me skip to my presentation anyway. So just give a bit of background on the BDA for those who aren't familiar with it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's quite a large project financed by the ICT group in, in Luxembourg uh, of the European Commission and it att attempts to do a foundational work for European companies and so they can provide big data solutions on top of some base technologies. It deals with many different aspects such as multilingualism, multiculturalism, scalability, uh, linked data, semantic interoperability, etc. Um, Within the BDA, there was a, a transport cycle challenge goal, which I believe it's Maxime is the person that's helping to lead that from the BDA, and that's how I've been looked in. So some of the objectives that we had at the workshop was just to provide some input to the requirements and definition stage of the BDA uh, project, and also try to give a, I present a high-level consistent view of transport data, what exists, and what technologies are required to get any kind of value or some interesting applications from it. However, we, we pretty much bumped into a, an obstacle straight away in our discussion. Um, everybody's wearing their own hats and their own glasses, and we're seeing their big data uh, challenges as being different, as their transport challenges being different. So we set about trying to understand each other. So we came up with three d d dimensions, or three different domains, if you like, where we talked to, talk to big data and its possible applications from, a, from an infrastructure perspective from the perspective of a vehicle, primarily thinking of cars, buses, trucks, but also more broadly in public transport and also maritime transport. Okay. And then we talked about the user itself. Uh, we tried to talk the user in the most generic way possible, which wasn't easy. And then we looked at some key data types that exist within each, each of those domains. Now, there's different uh, terms that are bandied around in big data research, but three of the fundamentals are actually a velocity, a variety, and volume. So for you to be able to say, I do have a big data challenge, or I do have a source of big data, you want to try to quantify it in those three Vs. Now, sometimes they're overstated and overstretched. Um, you can talk about volume in one sense if it's pure textual data, and you can talk about volume in another sense if it's video data, and the two aren't comparable. Also, the variety of which it, uh, sorry, the variety of the data that you're mixing or comes from a single source is also an issue. The more variety, the more complex. However, you can have highly varied data that's not complex, just very rich in information. And then I might have mentioned also the volume in which it's created, sorry, excuse me, the velocity in which it's created, how quickly you generate it and how quickly you can capture it, store it, process it, and derive any value from it. So on the infrastructure point of view, what we try to do is try to prioritize or try to get a grip on what is the different complexity from a technological perspective for each of the data types. So when we looked at infrastructure, the first category we had was dynamic maps and attributes, and we would have classed those as being high in volume, low in velocity, and very high in variety. So your dynamic maps don't change, but there's a high volume of them. Just think about all the different types of digital photography that exists and how it can be generated also on a day-by-day -day basis if you have some way of sensing it from vehicles or from users that are moving through that map. We looked at maintenance data. This is more to do with uh, the infrastructure, of course, and very low volume very low variety, sorry, excuse me, very low velocity, but very high variety. Operational data, if you're talking about a public transport authority, that's uh, whether it's a small city or a large city, it's, it's high, high, and high, both its complexity and the requirement of the types of tools that are, that are needed in the future to deal with it, but also the potential that can come from getting the right level of exploitation with big data in an operational sense is, is quite high also. And then we also discussed foresighting. Uh, foresighting is not necessarily thinking about how do I plan what I do with my, big data, with my big data sources and how can I do something today, tomorrow, or the next week, or the month after. So how can I use it as a foresighting tool for planning 
five, six, seven, eight, ten years down the road. Um, we all came to the same conclusion during the workshop. Uh, nobody knows exactly whether it's high volume, high velocity, high variety. It's, a, it's an open research question. We then moved on to vehicles. Uh, my own perspective on that, my presentation was very much focused on this. I didn't think of infrastructure and I didn't think of the user too much either. But we got into it. So we're talking about vehicles, location as high volume, low velocity, and very high variety. Okay. Driver monitoring, we had a zero and a zero in volume and velocity. What I mean by driver monitoring is what kind of sensors are going to be available in a vehicle? If we think beyond, let's say, a typical glass cockpit that you find in an aircraft down to the next car I buy in three or four years' time, what kind of monitoring is it going to be doing the driver and for what reasons? Is it going to be trying to look at my level of stress? Is it going to try to be predicting how I'm going to drive? Is it going to try to predict how I'll interact with my outside environment, etc.? So there's a, quite a lot of aid on that one and we didn't quite get to a conclusion except for then the zero is saying that we still don't know. However, we were pretty sure that there's a huge amount of variety. Um, I'll move on. We then talked about performance data from a vehicle. This can be interpreted in so many different ways, whether it's from the point of view of operating a, a transport infrastructure or just purely a private motors moving from A to B. And we believe that was high volume, high velocity, high variety, and the complexity of dealing with it is, although it's a, a known quantity, there's still challenges in the future there. And then we discussed the telemetry that's coming off the vehicles itself, which we distinguish from performance. Okay, which we would have classified as high volume, high velocity, and low variety. Uh, telemetry is normally pretty much the same. Then we talk about private users. Um, yet again, this is another one that was a, quite a bone of contention and debate, um, or very good natured. But we talked about what is a user? Are we talking about a public transport user? Are we talking about who operates the bus network? Are we talking about somebody who needs to get on that bus and then transfer it to the car to get home? So we looked at all the different types of data that we could, data you might find under that particular dimension, and we settled on events, state, behaviors, and personal activity. So you get in events, we had a question mark on what exactly what constitutes an event when we're talking about the private user. We did agree that there was a very high velocity and a very high variety. Um, naturally, uh, you can't really look at it any other way than say this very high variety because we talk about in, uh, personalization and, and individualism. With the state, if we're talking about different perspectives. There is very high variety when we're talking about the vehicle aspect of it, but if we talk about the user as, as it interacts with the infrastructure, that was kind of, we believe there was low volume and low variety. People have the same routines, travel the same routes typically. And behaviors, uh, if we're talking about the vehicle aspect of it, there's very high variety and there's very high velocity and behavior information, but the volume is quite low. But yet again, if you talk about this being, uh, yet again, a, a person using a public transport network, the, the same pattern was found. And then personal activity, we distinguished from the events and behaviors a little bit. You'll forgive me if I don't remember exactly what we did there. Uh, it's are in our, our the notes in the minutes in the meeting. We tried to come to some conclusions, identify some open issues and some challenges, and I'll just run through those. So although there was a, a, a great disconnect when we first started the debate, there was many commonalities between the different domains and the different data types. This is right, this was clear. However, we spend most of our time as a group, and there's quite a few experts in the room, trying to get a common understanding between us. So one of the one of the issues I would have identified from that particular workshop was there's a lot more debate needed from people who are looking at, at transport or the cycle challenges in transport from their own specific points of view. Uh, I think that's quite important. We also saw there's very high diversity in applications of big data technologies, and to just reinforce what David himself said in his previous presentation, in some cases, we're not looking to do anything new in big data. We'll just begin to call it what it is and try to figure out what can we do if we fuse and have more data and try to get more compelling solutions into the market. Uh, another, a more complete understanding of those data challenges is also required because once that's done, I think there's going to be a hindrance to trying to use or apply solutions in the market and therefore any kind of commercial or, uh, or market opportunities. Some of the open issues. Um, building big data expertise is a problem for everybody who's working in data at the moment. Um, there's a lack of professionals in it, and there's quite a lack of professionals in the transport domain. Furthermore, people who have to get to grips with the era of big data also have to become educated and understand what can and cannot be done and how to do it. Privacy is and will remain a significant issue, uh, even beyond the privacy uh, aspects of it, data, personal data aspects of it, legal aspects of it. 
we also have to start to begin to consider the ethics of decisions that are made over big data in the transport uh, sector. Another issue that was identified as well as control and measurement of the quality of data is providence if it's trustworthy. David uh, uh, alluded to this in his previous presentation also. Also, we don't get those quality metrics correct in the data that we're trying to, trying to the data we have available and the type of knowledge we're trying to extract from it. What kind of confidence can we have in it? As I said, there's a lack of understanding between the different dimensions and the transport domain. This could lead to rifts between the different groups. And then if we do find that rifts start to appear, so for instance, people are working dealing with users, people work dealing with vehicles, and people don't work dealing with infrastructures, if we all go forward in the big data world, developing solutions, techniques, knowledges, and knowledge on our own, and we don't interact, we could end up compounding another existing problem we have, which is silos in data, where people won't open the data or won't make the data access. You could find in a particular branch of an area that you will have people who progress forward and the other associated domains will be left behind. Some of the or more technical issues we, we, we came across were there's still a significant lack of data formats and interoperability, and it's going to be a barrier. Uh, data loss is a significant issue and it's set to grow. The amount of data generated by a vehicle, the amount of data that's generated by roadside sensors, the amount of data that's generated by users is all been lost. Not all been lost, I should say. A vast majority has been lost. And we start to think of this in the context of an Internet of Things world, the data will continue to be lost. Now, the, you could argue that all this data doesn't need to be captured or processed or stored, but until we understand what levels of data we're losing, we won't be able to make the determination of whether we're losing anything of value or not. Linking data across the domains, whether it's not just within the different branches of the transport sector, but also in, 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 in the whole world in general, if you understand me, it needs to be taken care of. And there is a linked, link, uh, linked data or a data linking issue that still needs to be resolved. Also, driving value from data is another issue that needs to be addressed. David spoke about that more than I did. And also, another issue that we saw as a problem as well, as particularly we're thinking about the Internet of Things and the Internet of Things as a generation, generator of data, is how can we do simple, economic, and above all, in situ processing of data? So the whole idea of everything just gets dumped back to some sort of magic cloud and do all the processing and give it back to you in a nicely presented way that you can do something with it. That's not practical and it's not feasible. And with the ubiquitous and universal levels of computing devices that we all have in our daily lives, the question has to be asked, is there some way that we can do this on the edge, near to the user and the generation of the data itself? And that is my presentation, short and simple. Any questions? Thank you, Sean. Uh, we did receive a few questions. So if you're ready, I'll start with the first. Sure. With which are the key application areas of big data that you see in the transport domain? The ones that came up when we were talking in, uh, in, in Bordeaux was a war in the infrastructure domain is try to, let's say, there's some, some examples given, for instance, if we could analyze big data sources, can we try to see, if, let's say, a private company that was awarded a public transport uh, uh, contract to operate buses or train services, they're complying with the levels of uh, service that they, they, they chose to do. It would, could also be argued that the particular organization that's running that kind of a, a service could also use the same data source and decide where they want to comply with that uh, uh, service level agreement or not, whatever's most economically viable. That was one. There was another uh, that was mentioned as well as about trying to try to schedule exactly better your own tra trip, your own travel, whether it's by private transport, by public transport. So you do begin to try to uh, avoid the different types of bottlenecks. Um, there was other examples of how it could be used for some proactive or, or forward-looking road maintenance and operational maintenance of different types of transport infrastructure. From our own perspective, we were looking at is how some of the big data that's generated by vehicles or connected vehicles can be used to actually enhance the type of vehicles we're driving and the type of safety systems and assistive systems that are offered in cars and also give us a little bit of a, a leg up and a step forward in the transition towards autonomous driving. So there's some of the ones that did come up. Thank you. Um, the second question was about how can we ever be fully certain that the autonomous vehicles will not be hacked? You can't. So. <clears throat> That's a short and simple answer, just you can't. Short and brief, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
since we don't have so much time, I think I'll hand it over to Maxim now. Yeah. Um, but thank, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, I'm very glad to uh, follow up this uh, uh, follow up with this um, this webinar on the workshop of Bordeaux. Um, uh, we um, we touch upon a few a few topics uh, the, during this this, um, and we looked at a broad uh, set of different uh, uh, applications for uh, transport and and the use of big data for transport. But uh, uh, there, I'm going to look at more closely at the um, the outcome of the discussions from the breakout session on on policy. And um, first, I'd like to start with the uh, broad overview of. Um, of the big data and the fact that big data is not is actually a set of uh, of, of uh, different uh, trends and and uh, technology advance, advances that have happened over the ten last years or even more and uh, and gradually these uh, putting these different uh, technology trends you uh, you end up with the possibility to really uh, get uh, uh, to the, the the paradigm of big data. Um, uh, so, th so these different um, aspects are uh, coming from the, the, the possibility to to uh, collect new data um, from different sensors, uh, and, uh, from enhanced sensors, uh, the, the possibility to store this data and uh, to uh, compute and then to uh, distill, um, distillate this data and aggregate this data uh, in, um, in an efficient way and then also acquire this data through uh, uh, new uh, technology, so a uh, new communication technology. So basically, we are getting to a, a near real-time uh, use and transmission of, of massive amounts of data. And and when it comes to the policy uh, issue here, we um, we always see that policy policy is trying to play catch up with uh, with these uh, advances and these combinations of uh, of different uh, new technologies and new ideas and new services that are coming uh, on the on the market, um, and and that's I think natural. Uh, innovation does not necessarily um, need to wait for policy to happen. Uh, it's more that uh, uh, here in 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 this case, uh, innovation happens, and then um, uh, policy sees uh, how to best uh, make uh, uh, use of these uh, new innovation in order to serve uh, the larger public and the. Uh, and um, and even preserve some of the rights of the of the users. So um, so um, I'm, I was glad to see a policy discussion in this uh, in this workshop, and um, and we really have to think of uh, the different actors and how where this data how this data is actually acquired, where this data comes from, and and how and and all the different uh, possible. Possible uses of this data in the in the in the chain of uh, of uh, information that leads to eventually uh, uh, end user product. And uh, I like this this picture really showing that um, it's not only about collecting the data, but it's also about making sense out of it and 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 visualizing it. Um, so during the the workshop, we showed uh, different uh, different viewpoints on big data in transport and then uh, from public transport from the use of uh, this data in urban planning uh, in real-time traffic information which is perhaps the, the most uh, the, the most obvious for many people in in, uh, in the audience uh, but also fleet logistics was shown as a as an example uh, the way to uh, understand better uh, how the vehicle uh, is uh, is functioning and and uh, and its diagnosis uh, and also Im improve uh, in product development improve the, these vehicles and improve the different functionalities of the vehicles in order to um, uh, to come up with a new product development understand the satisfaction satisfaction of the customers and and uh, and eventually more from a research point of view and from a, a societal point of view uh, understand from behavior. Uh, the, the, the micro micro behavior, but also macro behavior of uh, the 
uh, transport users. So all this is very interesting from a from a from a policy perspective because it uh, uh, using the data that is being collected, you end up with a, a real um, a very large amount of different uh, possibilities uh, for um, uh, for the um, uh, to to improve the, uh, the 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 society for for everyone and uh, so there are many potential impacts in transport uh, that are interested interesting from policy and that that clearly leads to a support from the policy makers uh, so I listed uh, some of them here in terms of resource efficient transport for environmentally friendly transport safer mobility. Uh, better um, mobility from door to door, less congestions, um, uh, social, economic, and behavioral uh, better understanding of the transport needs and and uh, behaviors, and then um, uh, understanding how personal data is actually um, treated. Uh, Building up a better policy making uh, uh, in terms of looking uh, forward, forward looking policy making, and then uh, finally a global leadership of European transport industry. So all these topics are extremely important from policy point of view, and that's why uh, the, the European Commission is, is is really looking at these uh, opportunities in a, in the in in the next um, uh, research work programs, etc. But then, uh, looking at the break, breakout session, uh, we came up with a few um, a few uh, points on which we really have to work. And uh, uh, the first, the role of the public side uh, to set up open data environment. And there, there is it was really um, agreed that um, if there is one thing that the public uh, authorities should do is to encourage. Um, these uh, these sharing of data, um, open big data. It's good to have big data, but if it's not open, then uh, it is uh, it is really a not um, uh, n not a, a great environment. So an example of that is was uh, mentioned as the mobility as a service, uh, a large initiative uh, that is um, uh, very much supported by the Nordic countries. Uh, it's uh, in short, it's uh, very often called math and um, So, but what was expected from a public-private role understanding is that to, um, from the EU side, to promote the use of open data, but uh, look at regulation very carefully, and uh, only if needed, we need to have a set of regulations. But uh, uh, very often, the, it came back to ask uh, not to. Um, let to let the the market as much as as possible um, uh, evolve um, without uh, stifling the the innovation uh, through regulations. But one one thing that came out uh, on if there would be something needed on regulations is is uh, the possibility or the, the need uh, that would uh, that the data center somehow would have to be. Are regulated with at least a minimum uh, minimum service uh, level uh, that would have to be um, provided by these data centers if they are uh, uh, from the industry side. So that was for the public uh, private role and really a fine line between the, the two um, um, and, and a careful uh, message uh, to not to regulate too much. So. Um, from the privacy issues um, and especially the reuse rights, um, I think uh, Big Data Europe project could do a lot of work on better giving guidance on the principles of, of privacy by, by design. And then um, having uh, uh, perhaps an example was having checklists to uh, understand better or to test if uh, the privacy um, by design is actually respected in, in uh, the different services. And then um, better guidelines on how to anonymize and aggregate data. And then uh, sometimes it is uh, for transport, some, some people say, yeah, well, we ne would need a specific privacy, uh, specific privacy network uh, framework specifically for uh, transport. And, uh, 
And uh, there I put a question mark because um, we have a privacy framework, an overall European privacy network, and I don't know if here the policy makers need to uh, scrutinize or look look carefully at the transport and then uh, settle uh, set up a, a specific privacy framework for some of the uh, big data um, uh, big data um, uh, applications for transport. Um, so, uh, so we need to be careful with that. Uh, it is done in the U.S. Uh, specific privacy frameworks. So, um, but at the same time, uh, we need to be careful on the Euro European side to not um, contradict, let's say, the, the overall privacy framework that is set up uh, by the European Union. The, the uh, next uh, topic is the consumer cho choice, um, which. Um, was mentioned as a very important issue. Uh, and um, two initiatives were mentioned, a free flow initiative of, of uh, specifically uh, supported by the European Union. And, and then another one that is more um, an awareness campaign on my car, my, my data, um, that is supported by the um, Automobile International Automobile Association uh, uh, um, uh, the Automobile Users Association. So, um, and and what we really want to avoid is the is statements like like we like uh, that surprise everyone, like uh, the one that was uh, given at the CES this, at the beginning of this year, uh, where um, where uh, there is this misconception that we. Uh, we are actually looking at the people and and uh, knowing exactly what they are uh, what they are doing. I think that in Europe, what we want to uh, do is to have good uh, campaigns for the uh, consumers in order to make them understand that they are indeed uh, giving away uh, some personal information, but at the same time, this information is not going to be uh, used against them. And this data is useful for some specific uh, um, um, specific um, applications for which they have direct uh, benefits. So, and then the last uh, the last um, item uh, of the policy was on standardization and on the need to better standardize uh, the area of big data. And there, uh, there was also a lot of uh, um, doubts on whether the policy should let the market decide at the moment, uh, let the market grow, uh, see uh, what are the uh, best practices that are going to come out, and what are the standards that will uh, be um, that will be um, adopted, let's say, de facto, and uh, um, uh, so so not to be too um, pushy on standardizing something that may not be actual in the in the the next the, the next year so um, so what was clearly understood is that open apis should be encouraged and uh, uh, as long as there is good interfaces uh, giving uh, open information uh, uh, then uh, the standardization may not be uh, such a big need, and, and the market can perhaps uh, decide at the moment how to how to um, do. So, from a policy point of view, a lot of support, but also not a lot of messages uh, saying that they should not intervene or they should be caref caref carefully intervening in the um, the development of the market. So that concludes the policy view, uh, and I, I, I really hope that the next year we will have uh, new new um, discussions. Uh, we will organize another workshop, I believe, uh, in um, around uh, October, uh, and so um, uh, we will follow this up and or even look at uh, the pilots, the big data pilots that will come, um, that will be decided now in January. Uh, which big data pilots are going to be supported by Big Data Europe. So, Andrea? Thank you very much, Maxime. And uh, as we are a bit out of time, I would like to thank all the speakers.
Dave, Sean, and Maxime, thank you for taking the time to present. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please post them in the chat box. Well, I, can, I, can I just say about the, uh, you, you ask a question on uh, the, um, what was it again, the, Earlier, uh, you asked a question, how can we uh, ensure that the autonomous vehicles will not be hacked? And uh, honestly, uh, this, this question com comes all the time. So, uh, and uh, I think that we should turn it another way around. Uh, how can we today ensure that the vehicles are not going to be hacked uh, full stop? Uh, today, already, uh, you have examples of vehicles that are, that are being hacked. So. Um, there, there are a lot of a lot of things that the car manufacturers are doing at the moment, ensuring that uh, these vehicles that have some kind of connectivity cannot be uh, hacked. Whether it it is uh, uh, manually driven or automatically driven, it does not make a difference. If you can hack in a vehicle, you will be able to just uh, steer or brake the vehicle with the, the current technology that is in the vehicle. So um, so let's not mix the different messages. So automated vehicles and, and hacking uh, is, um, is of course uh, frightening, but at the same time we are, uh, uh, we have uh, the same problem with manually driven vehicles. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, we had another comment, uh, I believe this was uh, to Sean regarding his presentation. Sure. It was about quality control. Mm -hmm. So the comment says that uh, the asker was surprised not to see quality control in the list of challenges uh, at the end of the presentation on one of the last slides, because all the world, all the data in the world is useless if it's not high quality. I, I don't know whether it's a question or a statement. If it's a question. I can understand the point that when it came up in the workshop, you, you have to be able to trust the data you're using, particularly if it's coming from a source that you don't control. Uh, it's not a question about how it's a single threshold that you go above or below, but you have to understand that there's a certain level of trustworthiness and quality in the data that you're using in any kind of big data solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. And also that's the power of big data is to actually auto-regulate its quality. Um, you, if you get a stream of uh, a stream of data that um, turns out to be um, not that that you can you can verify somehow that this data is of poor quality, then you will start lowering your lowering the trust in this stream of data. Um, and so, by having big data, you can you can cross check different stream of data for their quality. I think that um, Dave, Dave has done some studies on that. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I actually I actually disagree slightly with the statement, and it will be it, unfortunately in this kind of forum, it's not possible to have an interactive discussion. But I would disagree slightly with the statement that um, all the data in the world is useless if you can't be sure of its quality. The, the the beauty of these approaches should be that you can use the fact that you've got so much data to identify which are of good quality and which are not of good quality and to effectively filter on that. Yeah. So providing that you can in some way differentiate between the good data and the bad da the data, um, then you're, you're absolutely golden. That's not yeah. an issue. But overall, yes, you're quite right. You, you've, I, th I think I said this, it's, it's very difficult for end users to understand the value of a um, of a data source or the quality of a processed data source, and it is that process of distillation, of pulling out valuable information from raw data, which adds the value. And that's where you can go from very very noisy, very uncertain, grubby, horrible data to useful information, and it's the quality of the information that matters not the quality of the data that you derive it from. I think, I think you can use an analogy, uh, David, from where we get our news from. If it's of very little importance to you, wherever the source is, you're just looking for some sort of information and you're happy to infer from that what you wish. However, the more, the more critical or the more important it is that you're correctly informed, 
all of us as human beings, we start to resort to our own preferred news sources that we believe are trustworthy, that are well curated, that are well presented. And I don't think the, I think the analogies are applicable in the big data world as well. Depending on the importance of uh, you, you place or the dependence you have on the data you're working with, you will have uh, different levels of, uh, you, will, you will, sorry, excuse, I'm losing, I, I'm missing the word in English. You will have a different set of criteria or levels of, of standards that you expect that data to comply with. And I think it's a question of the data needs to be as clean and as high quality as the purpose you want to use it for. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. I do think that we are a bit over time. So thank you once again to the speakers and also to the attendees. Uh, we will be sending out the presentations and also publishing them on SlideShare. And you will have a short summary of the webinar today next week. So thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Goodbye. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Dave. Thank you. Bye-bye.